When I was nine years old, my fourth grade class had three to five new students, which was an abnormally high number considering how late we were into the system. Anyways, while my teacher was taking roll, he got to like the third or fourth new student and he went, Hmm, you know, I, uh, I noticed we have a lot more new students. Would anyone like to take this new student on a tour? And I immediately raised my hand. No one else did. But the teacher let me have the new student to take on a tour. Incidentally, my name also appeared next on the roster, so he called me next in roll call. My birthday also falls the day after that student as well. But the story is not about her. The story is about another student. You see, after class, during the first recess, I set to take out this girl on a tour, and another one of the new students asked to have a tour as well. Now, I've always had a particular interest in new students, for a couple reasons. The first reason is that I have been going to that school since I was in kindergarten. And I had already established myself as a bit of an oddball. So the benefit of having a new student is that I can sort of become, become a new person, person for that new student. student. Another thing was that when you arrive at a new school as a new student, you're probably a little bit nervous and lonely and might have a hard time making friends. How incredible would it be for one of the students already there to go out of his way to be your friend and give you a tour around the school? I wanted to be the first student to be that new student's new best friend. Because I've always had a need to be needed. No, anyways. What followed after giving these two girls a tour was we all ended up in a group with some other new girls and some girls who had already been there for a few years. We did activities together, we played Foursquare, we talked at recess. Until eventually the group decided it would be fun to spend the entire recess harassing the boys. Well, the particular student, the second one, who asked me for a tour. I'm going to call her Anna. After the group of girls decided we were going to harass the boys at recess, Anna decided that this was not the friend group for her. Because you see, she was a sensible student and would prefer to play at recess rather than harass some people she didn't know. So she found a new group of girls who play basketball. And I was insanely jealous because you see, I had formed a connection with Anna. We were like, we were similar. She was my favorite person in the class, in the entire school even. And I had gone out of my way to give her a tour and to be her new best friend at the beginning of the year. And here she was going and being friends with some other girls who hadn't even tried to be her friend. This jealousy would plague me and I would write stories about the two of us where she actually wanted me. I would miss school because I knew she would be there and I would want to see her even if it meant I was just going to be following her around at recess as she talked to other people. Okay, I'm not done with you yet. I kind of like... Trans trigger talking points. I do want to apologize to anybody new in my audience. This video is going to be pretty navel gazy. I'm going to be mostly focusing on my own history with limerence um, in the hopes of somebody else relating and um, offering solutions. Uh, this is not the first navel gazing video I have done. I have done another video called Compulsive Over Exercising, which you can watch as well if you want to be further concerned with what kind of host you're dealing with on this channel. Um, but this is mostly to help other people who have been in a similar situation. I have. So and what is limerence? Limerence is defined as a state of mind which results from romantic or non-romantic feelings for another person and typically includes intrusive, melancholic thoughts and or tragic concerns for the object of one's affection as well as a desire to form or maintain a relationship with the object of love and to have one's feelings reciprocated. Limerence can also be defined as an involuntary state of intense desire. So it goes beyond just making friends with somebody. It goes beyond on falling in love or having a crush. It is literally being addicted to somebody. Like an addiction, you will get a, a blast of dopamine that you would not normally experience when just talking to an individual. And it'll be so high that when the person leaves or stops talking to you or has to go somewhere else, you will feel an intense withdrawal. You'll feel miserable. You'll walk around like a corpse waiting for your next hit of dopamine and until then you will feel like death. My relationship with Anna went beyond a typical friendship because I was constantly thinking about her all the time and I felt this possessive hold upon her that you shouldn't have for people. 
and it was my first time experiencing it because I felt entitled to a relationship from her because I had put effort into cultivating a relationship with her. And I spent time pursuing her that I should have making other friends with plenty of the other kids in the class and in the grade. Fortunately, the story has a bit of a happier ending. And I did ultimately see that I was the best friend she could possibly have. And she spent the rest of the year being my friend. You know who you are and I'm so sorry and this has probably ruined our relationship forever. I hope you didn't watch this. So there are a few misconceptions around limerences and some things I want to add because this is a concept that was only first researched in the 1970s. I'm gonna go through some symptoms and see if there are any things I disagree with and discuss how I relate to these symptoms. So the first symptom is lack of clarity about who they are. As soon as you meet the person, the limerence is already set in. And you become obsessed without knowing anything about this human being. I would say that this is true. I can develop limerences for people before knowing the complete picture about this person, but generally it starts with one deep conversation where I get an overload of information about this, this person. There's a connection. The limerence only gets stronger as I get to know more about this person. Number two, intrusive thoughts that take up the entire day. Yes, I will have thoughts about the object of my limerence the entire day. It will keep me up at night. It will get in the way of my other relationships. When I was, um, when I was about 12 years old, I made friends with... I made friends with a lot of people. I had a couple of limerences that year. The strongest limerence I probably had in my entire life, with the exception of like uh, one, was when I was 12. I remember as I was going to meet another friend, I was in the car and I told my mother, Is it normal to get tired of your friends and kind of not want to be their friend anymore? The reason I was tired of her was not because I was tired of her or I was bored of her or anything like that. It was because I was obsessed with somebody else and I couldn't focus on any of my other relationships as long as I was obsessed with one person. Nobody emulate my terrible behavior, okay? Number three, the relationship is prioritized above real life. In the past, I allowed some of my limerences to get in the way of schoolwork. What do you mean in the past? In one that I'm going to talk about in a little more detail in the video, I would prioritize uh, conversations with her above schoolwork. I would prioritize calling her above my other responsibilities. Now what I do instead is I try to get my work done as soon as possible so that I have the opportunity to talk to the people I want to. Meaning I'll get my work done earlier than usual. But it'll still revolve around conversations with that one person. <laughs> I hate everything. Number four, emotionally dependent on the littlest reaction from them. You know how like in group chats, um, say on Instagram or Discord or group me or whatever, um, you have the option to react to messages with emojis. Yeah, I will get a little hit of dopamine if I see the object of my limerence react to my message or anyone else's message because it means they exist. I am emotionally dependent on the littlest reaction from them. And finally, desperately seeking validation. Why did I cut bangs? <laughs> so I thought I was gonna be quirky by running away from the camera and I accidentally broke my charger and my, uh, my uh, Apple Pencil. <laughs> what are the three stages of limerence and how do they differ from a healthy relationship because May I remind you, limerences are not healthy. So this website called mindbodygreen.com says that there are three steps to a limerence and I disagree, I think there are actually four. So it says that the three steps are Infatuation Crystallization And Deterioration So I think the first step is a connection. For me, it'll either be some kind of memorable activity we do together, such as going to Disneyland and, uh, never mind. Or it'll be through a conversation. It could be a conversation in person, FaceTiming, voice calling, texting, it doesn't matter. The next step is infatuation. Because after that one connection, I had such a rush of dopamine that I couldn't stop thinking about you and you were like the best person in the world. The infatuation kind of corresponds to the first feelings of falling in love with somebody in a healthy relationship. Positive emotions that you would get after meeting somebody or meeting a friend for the first time. Infatuation is just a more extreme and more self-centered version of that. The second step is crystallization. In a normal healthy relationship, it would be building up the relationship and getting to know each other better. 
In the case of a limerence, this is now the stage where you're trying desperately to keep this relationship together as long as you possibly can. It you will begin ignoring more and more red flags or turning red flags into green flags. Another thing I think that happens in this situation is you begin second guessing a lot more. You become anxious that the person might secretly hate you or might find you annoying or might not want to talk to you anymore. Even though you've gotten no sign whatsoever. In a normal relationship, this is when the permanent um, markers was set in. Like, this is going to become a long-term relationship or a long-term friendship. It's in a really good, stable place right now. You're no longer talking every day. You're just talking occasionally. Sometimes you can go to each other for advice. In a limerence, this is when everything is over. Now, for me, I have found that at the end of a limerence, it can go both ways. If the person I had a limerence for is complete and utter garbage, then I have no more desire to talk to this person and the relationship slowly fades. In other cases, the limerence ends and I develop a calmer, long-term, quieter relationship with that person. And we become good friends. What distinguishes limerences from normal healthy relationships? Normal healthy relationships have is a balance. In a normal healthy relationship, the other person's needs should come with or above yours. Assuming the person holds your own feelings in the same respect. I have been in situations where I've held people's feelings above mine, and they have also held their own feelings above mine. That is not good, don't do that. But in a normal healthy relationship, you should prioritize the other person, and the other person should prioritize you. In a limerence, you are prioritizing yourself. It's all about how this person makes you feel. For myself, my limerences aren't necessarily incompatible with actual friendships or relationships because it begins with a friendship and turns into a limerence. Because I'm just like that. I do generally prioritize the feelings of this other person above my own. But it still comes with the obsessive, fixative, intrusive thoughts. I, I can safely say that I do prioritize the feelings and health and happiness of, a, of the object uh, or the victim, as my current victim says, of a limerence above my own of the limerence is the addictive nature. So in a normal relationship, if the person is garbage and has a horrible, unkind, selfish character, you don't want to spend time with them. But if this person is the object of your limerence, then despite the person's flaws, you still want to be with this person as much as possible. Even if it makes you feel horrible. So limerence is an umbrella term for an addictive, obsessive relationship where you yourself are centered. A pretty common a type of limerence that you might have heard of before is called a parasocial relationship. And what is a parasocial relationship? It's when you become attached to a celebrity, an online influencer, a, a historical figure. You become so fixated on this person that you spend all your time thinking about this person to the point that your brain begins perceiving this person that you have never met before as somebody you know, and you're suddenly in a relationship with them. What makes a parasocial is that it's one-sided. And liking a celebrity or an influencer, that's normal and that's healthy, but the limerence and therefore the parasocial relationship sets in when I become emotionally dependent on this person. I have also had parasocial relationships as well, one with a dead guy and one with the guy pretty much is dead already. But yes, both got in the way of my schoolwork and other relationships. For me, limerences often go hand in hand with a lot of creative expression. I will talk to you, there will be an intense connection, uh, I will begin becoming fixated on you. You might get a portrait. You might get a song written about you. Hopefully we have not gone this far yet, and if you're incredibly lucky, you'll get more than one song written about you. Anyways, what are we talking about? Another type of limerence is something that is very relevant to me and to a lot of other autistic people. It's something I've decided to call either autistic bonding or autistic imprinting. Now imprinting is what werewolves and ducks do. So when ducks are born, they will imprint upon the first thing that they see. And hopefully it is the mother, because this duck will now follow the mother around everywhere and feel attached to the mother. Well, imprinting is a bit similar. It's basically when an autistic person meets somebody and imprints on that person, you are now my possession. And I own you. I'm just kidding, I'm just kidding, I'm just kidding! <laughs> now why is this the case? We autistic people are known for our fixations on different topics, and how emotional we are. Yes, even though autistics might have a hard time expressing our emotions, we are extremely emotional and probably feel more emotion than the average neurotypical person. This combined can easily lead to a limerence. When I was like 
10 or 11 and I hadn't come out of the autistic closet yet. I'm just kidding. I read a book called Uniquely Human by Dr. Barry M. Prisant. 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 Dr. Barry M. Prisant. And he wrote a chapter entitled Enthusiasms. And enthusiasms were his word for autistic obsessions or special interests. And in Enthusiasms, he said that some autistic people can develop fixations on different people. So that's something that's been explored as well. I want to give a, a shout out to my friend Omic for sending me this website called 10 Reasons People with Autism Struggle with Friendships. I want to highlight the last three of the 10. Overly friendly and attachment issues. Autistic people tend to have very few boundaries. Very ambiguous boundaries. Jealousy and possessiveness. Unfortunately, we autistic people have very selfish tendencies. This does not justify what we do. This is just a reality and one of our struggles that we have to overcome. And this often means that we get jealous and possessive over people we really like and need to be in contact all the time. If we are fixated on a person, we don't want to be out of that person's presence at all. Okay, Othniel, you've explained to us what limerences are. You've explained to us that you have an unhealthy relationship with every single human you come into contact with. Are you going to sit here and expect us to cry as you whinge over your lonely, miserable life while we dab our eyes with tissues? No. I am self-aware enough to know that limerences are very unhealthy. I have been somewhat open about my relationship here before. If you want to know more, you can read a blog I wrote about it, or you can watch this live stream where I talk about it in more detail. Basically, there were a lot of issues in this relationship. The first being that it was online. A really big part of the relationship and why it went wrong was because I developed a limerence for this person. And this person also developed a limerence for me. It was a mutually enabling addiction, 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 addiction to each other. The main reasons I think that limerences are bad are because it gives you an unrealistic view of the person. So I'm gonna get Cole, um, this person, Rain Cloud. When I first met Rain Cloud, I noticed some little uh, orange flags about rain cloud she seemed uh, a bit insecure and she had somewhat toxic tendencies she would ask me to do something and if i didn't she would jokingly say then i'm never gonna talk to you again in a kind of like playful childish way that now after the first conversation i had with her we talked for like four hours straight the initial part of the limerence was i projected an unrealistically high character onto her i perceived her as a much higher and better person than she actually was Later in the relationship, she actually had an unrealistic view of me. During the crystallization aspect of our relationship, she began worrying that I was gonna go around and cheat on different girls, would dump her at any time, that I would leave her for somebody else, and no matter what I did, she didn't believe I possibly cared about her because her infatuation with me gave her a warped sense of who I was. So I would spend all of my time making artwork for her, um, affirming that I loved her, affirming that she was special and important. It was bad for me and it was bad for her because no amount of it would make her believe that I did actually care about her. Uh, number two, uh, it gives you withdrawal. If anything is giving you a high when you're doing it or when you're on something and then you feel an intense withdrawal or you feel like death when it's taken away from you, it's probably best to either reduce uh, the amount of time you spend doing whatever you're doing or to quit cold turkey. Number three, it hurts your relationship with other people, especially those you actually care about. When I was so fixated on my girlfriend at the time, I prioritized it over my relationships with people at school and with my own family members. I was willing to believe her and tell her things that I wouldn't tell other people, even though she was taking advantage of things I said to her. Number four. It gives this person too much power over you. So if you develop a limerence with a good person, great, perfect, awesome. But limerences cannot tell the difference. So if you develop a limerence toward um, a toxic, manipulative, even aggressive person, that is incredibly horrible for you because you're giving this already messed up person way too much power and way too much control over you. You will end up extremely hurt in the relationship. And it will be partially your fault because you didn't address the problem. No, the final issue is not quite as relevant to people who aren't Christians, but it does have elements that even non-Christians can take away from. And it's, interestingly enough, the final reason of why I realized my own over-exercising. The Bible says, Thou shalt have no other gods before me. And that basically says, if anything, running, my own physical appearance, gets in the way of God, that is sin, and that is hindering my relationship with God. I can't grow 
in Christ as long as I am keeping exercising my God. That is my drive to overcome this over-exercising more than anything else because I love God and He is the reason I am everything I am. If you are prioritizing conversations with this person about prayer, if you are prioritizing time spent doing things for this person or being with this person over reading your Bible, if this person's validation comes before your desire to please and honor God, then congratulations, you have found an idol and that is a sin that is idolatry. 1 Corinthians 10, 14 says, therefore my dear friends, flee from idolatry. And the verse before that, 1 Corinthians 10, 13 says, No temptation has overtaken you except such as is common to man. But God is faithful who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able, but will, with the temptation, also make a way to escape, that you will be able to bear it. Limerences, the infatuation, the intrusive thoughts, they are uncontrollable. They are not your fault. However, they are temptations, and God allows temptations to enter our lives. Temptations to steal, temptations to feel pride, or temptations to allow idols into our lives, such as with limerences. But it is up to us to resist the temptation and do that. It is up to us to either learn to see that person in a more healthy light, or to end the relationship altogether if we're unwilling to perceive this person as anything other than a god in our lives. In my research of limerences, it suggested that limerences are not the result of a healthy mind, and that they are a product of abuse or neglect. I personally don't think I have trauma, if you want to psychoanalyze me, armchair psychology me, I do actually enjoy that. So, how to cure limerences? Live healthier! Because limerences are the product of unhealthy thinking, and the best way to have healthy thinking is to have healthy eating, healthy sleeping, healthy exercising. Some other things that I found helpful are, you know, expressing my obsessive feelings, either through talking with a trusted adult, talk <laughs> talking to somebody about it, probably a therapist, it's not so nice to uh, trauma dump or use your friends as therapists. The conclusion. If you experience limerences, it's not your fault, but there's also nothing good about it. If anything good comes out of limerences, it is because the limerence has changed into a more healthy mutual care for somebody else. Another thing, it is idolatry. I, mean, I have been very upfront about it since the first video on my channel. This is a Christian channel. I preach what the Bible says. If you allow somebody to be the object of your limerence, you are allowing idolatry into your life. Um. I should get off the